I'm David Hamburger, and in this three-part series, we're going to talk about how to get good at playing fingerstyle blues. Now, what are we even talking about? Like, what does that mean? Talking about getting good. How would you even define what it means to be good at playing fingerstyle blues? Well, I'm going to suggest that if you want to play better fingerstyle blues, there are three things you could look at. One is developing a repertoire of tunes, actually knowing some specific songs that are part of the blues tradition and the blues vocabulary. Second, being able to play those tunes with a certain degree of confidence and expression. And finally, three, being able to make those tunes your own, whether that's from putting together aspects of different versions you like into your version, learning to improvise on those tunes, or any of the steps in between and around those two things. So if that's what you want to do, then the very next question becomes, what do you work on? And if you need or want to have a repertoire of tunes, the first thing you can do is learn some tunes. And by that, I don't necessarily mean learning how to play so-and-so's version of the tune note for note. I mean learning some basic 8-bar and 12-bar tunes, classic kinds of tunes like Baby Please Don't Go, or Sitting on Top of the World, or Crow Jane, or Nobody's Fault But Mine, or the tune that I just played, which is, um, of course, You Got to Move. These kinds of tunes, um, they've been around. They, um, they're sturdy, they're flexible, you can do a lot with them. Um, and there are multiple versions of them. So you can kind of draw from different people's versions of them from different even, you know, periods of time from like early acoustic versions to later, you know, ensemble versions and everything in between to try to come up with a sense of what makes that tune sound like that tune. Um, so learning the tune itself, just the, the basic melody, the chord progression, the groove is the first step. And once you have that basic eight or 12 or 16 bars, then you can develop that into a complete song with things like intros or shout choruses or solos. And when you have a specific tune you're gonna work on, that helps you practice with a certain kind of focus because you know that you're working on learning this particular tune and learning, on, learning to play it a particular way. And also, Learning tunes is different from learning licks or pieces of tunes because it gives you a real way to measure your progress. Now, obviously, like music is subjective and even, uh, and particularly, traditional music is subject to all kinds of rhythmic and melodic and even harmonic variations. But if you decide you're going to learn to play a particular song, then there is this sense of either you can play it or you can't. You either know the melody or you don't. You know the chord progression or you don't. And that kind of objectivity can make your practicing a lot clearer. And when you know what it is you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it, you can measure it. And so you can have a much better sense of whether you're getting where you're trying to go or not. So I got to admit, like I was not a particularly focused practicer for at least the first I don't know, 10 years or more of playing guitar. Um, and I also didn't grow up learning a lot of traditional blues tunes, like a lot of the folk revival musicians that I really admired when I was learning to play. I couldn't often find recordings of the classic, you know, pre-war blues people, or even, you know, like country guitar players like Merle Travis or Chet Atkins. Certainly couldn't find records of people like Gary Davis and, uh, and uh, Skip James or Robert Johnson right away. I could find a lot of their, the people learned from them, like Dave Van Ronk and Roy Bookbinder and those kinds of people and John Hammond. But it was hard to find the original records for whatever reason. But um, eventually, I was of course able to find those records. And one of the things that gave me a really deep uh, appreciation of traditional music was when I started uh, writing for guitar player and for acoustic guitar magazine because those magazines couldn't uh, or wouldn't pay for the rights to uh, copywritten tunes. So you couldn't, if you were teaching a lesson on like, well, here's how to play a steady bass or here's how to play slide guitar. Like you couldn't use a Muddy Waters song. You couldn't use a Hank Williams song. 
you couldn't use a Robert Johnson song. You had to use songs that qualified as public domain, meaning songs that were old enough and widespread enough that everybody did them and nobody really had claim to the copyright. And so that made me, because I was doing that kind of work, uh, that made me uh, go and look for uh, the tunes that you know, could be considered public domain. And one thing that I noticed about those songs is that they're really, uh, they're really sturdy and they're really flexible. They make great teaching tools. And because there are so many versions of them, there's a certain freedom in learning those kinds of tunes because you can, to some extent, do what you want with them, which is, um, you know, one of the big questions for a lot of people is like, well, how do I make this more expressive? How do I make this sound like me when a lot of guitar education, particularly around roots music, is all about emulation? Like, here's how to play like so-and-so, right? But if you start learning tunes as tunes, not as the so-and-so version of the tune, that affords you a certain kind of flexibility within the realm of still playing traditional music and still playing recognizable songs. So the public domain songs are familiar um, and they're really, as I said, they're really sturdy. They're also very flexible. Um, another thing that is really good about them is you can play them uh, as vocal tunes or as instrumental tunes. And one thing that I uh, have found really helps is learning an instrumental version of a tune, like putting the melody on the guitar. Because if you don't sing, and a lot of us don't, I certainly didn't for the first many, many years of playing guitar, um, it still gives you something recognizable to play as opposed to just blues licks. If you can play the melody to a tune, like Baby Please Don't Go or Crow Jane or one of these tunes I mentioned, um, or you know, dozens, hundreds of other tunes, um, then when you sit down to play, you can play something with a beginning, a middle, and an end, even if that's only eight or 12 bars. Um, and if you do sing, then one of the other big questions is, well, okay, I sang the tune. What do I do to keep it interesting when I'm not singing? And the answer is, well, you can play the melody. The melody sounds great on the guitar. Um, so learning instrumental versions of these tunes um, can be really effective. Um, as a learning tool and as something that you can then turn around and play for your own satisfaction or when you're playing with or for somebody else. Um, and finally, the, the great thing about learning the tune as a tune is that when you're learning a version of a tune, uh, if you're trying to play, uh, you know, Cannonball Rag like Merle Travis, or you're trying to learn to play Crow Jane like Skip James, those performances are the summation of, you know, decades of someone's work as an artist and you know they've put so much of what they know how to do into it that you're starting by trying to scale this height of playing something that is potentially very complex very nuanced and also you know goes on for you know several choruses and you're it's kind of setting yourself up uh for failure in a way because you might master that, but more often than not, you'll feel like, well, I got the first two choruses down, only 10 more choruses to go, right? But if you set out to learn tunes, it's more manageable. It's like, yeah, you can learn the tune. The tune is eight bars or 16 bars long. You can learn the tune. You can even learn the tune as informed by someone's particular version without feeling like you have to, you know, eat the whole elephant, basically. You know, you can basically learn a part of it and then go, okay, well, now I know the tune and I understand how they did it and what can I do with it from here? And that can be a much more approachable, insane way to work on playing this kind of music. You can come at these tunes at whatever level you're currently at. So if your current capacity is to start putting melodies over the bass and eight or 12 bars is enough of a challenge for you right now, cool. Learn that melody and call it a win when you've got that melody sitting in a really nice pocket over the bass and everything's sitting together really nicely and you can play it and it sounds like the song. If you're at a point where you can start to put some other things around that, like an intro and an ending and a turnaround and maybe a little bit of a solo, you can do that and you can take the tune and develop it out like that until you actually have a two to three minute performance that you've put together out of things that 
you currently understand. And if you're able to do all that and have a capacity to do some improvisation and include a solo in the middle of all that, fantastic. Whatever level you find yourself currently at, you can use these tunes as a vehicle. You can focus in on the things you need to know right now to improve your playing, and you can go from there. So these tunes will meet you at whatever level you're currently at. So let's take this tune that I played at the outset, You Got to Move. A few weeks ago, I did a pretty in-depth lesson uh, sort of walking through um, you know, the blow by blow of how to put the tune together. So rather than completely reiterate that right now, I wanna sort of use that as a point of departure and look at how learning a basic version of the tune can help you work on these three really important skills. Your right hand coordination, meaning how your thumb and your fingers line up and how to get that to be solid. Um, how it can help you learn uh, phrasing, how blues phrasing, which is so fundamental to uh, everything about playing blues from interpreting a song to improvising on it. Learning the melodies to classic blues tunes will build your vocabulary uh, and your sense of how blues is phrased and played. And finally, how you can use the basic version of the tune as a springboard to draw in aspects of how other people play the tune and without necessarily trying to learn their entire version, how you can take, say, uh, you know, a set of chords from one version, the groove from another version, the way the melody is played from a third version, the key it's played in from another version, put those things together so that your version is sourced from all these traditional places, but ends up being the version that you want to play because you've made these choices about the different things you can use. So let's start with just recapping the tune itself. Here is uh, the fundamental or basic version of the tune that you can play. I'm playing it in E. I'm playing with a quarter note bass. That's the groove that I've chosen. And I've taken this pass of the melody basically from the playing of Mississippi Fred McDowell. Now Fred McDowell played it with a slide and I'm playing it without a slide. So right there, kind of appropriating something. Just because I want to play the Fred McDowell melody, do I have to play it with a slide? No, I don't. But I can be inspired by that and take that and go, I like Fred McDowell's phrasing, makes sense to me, I'm going to put it over this steady bass. So it would sound like this. So the first thing you can do is start to take the tune apart. Now there's a tendency when playing fingerstyle to sort of go measure by measure, working through the tune and go, okay, I gotta grab this and then I gotta grab that and I gotta grab this third string, third thing, maybe the third string, but this third thing is what I meant to say. And I think it really helps if you can take it apart into this three-step process. And I've actually tabbed out this process. There's some tab that you can download for today's lesson and for the upcoming lessons. There's a link below, there's a link on screen. Um, you can go and look at this sort of breakdown that I call the horizontal three-step because it basically means remembering that what's going on musically is happening horizontally, not vertically so much. And there's three steps to working it out. The first thing is to separate out the bass, to just go, what's the bass? What am I doing with my thumb? What are the chords? What's the groove? Because what the thumb is doing, what the bass is playing, is basically the underpinning for the whole arrangement. The thumb is the rhythm section. It tells you the tempo, it tells you the groove, it tells you the chord progression. Everything that a rhythm section needs to in inform the listener and the other players of. So what we've got here is this eight bar chord progression, right? So if we just look at the first four bars, we've got two bars of E, And two bars of A, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? So we can separate that out and go, okay, this is how the bass line unfolds over time. That's our first horizontal idea. Then we can look at the melody.
and looking at it just as the melody lets us really focus on the phrasing, meaning the way that the melody is shaped, where it plays and where it stops to pause and breathe. And when we look at that, we might want to count that out too. And here we're counting one and two and three and four and 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 one and two and three. Now this is some real detail work, right? And this is very objective. Once you've decided on the phrasing, it's either you're either, you know, hitting it or you're not. But one thing that's really interesting we can notice about this besides that is that all four of these phrases have basically the same rhythm. They all are basically and four and one. And four and one. This one's a little different. And four and one and and four and one. Now, that immediately takes this from being like, oh, I gotta memorize this sea of numbers and I've got this sequence of things to remember to, oh, there's four phrases. Because it's a melody, it's a song, it's got words. And so there are four phrases to that opening four bars. And so now you can start thinking in terms of, well, I'm playing three notes and then landing on a chord. And that's sort of a mnemonic device to go, oh, that's basically what we're doing every time. So that's the second horizontal thing. Right? We got the bass going out, going along in time. We got the melody going along in time. Now your job as a guitar player is to make those two things happen at the same time. And if you've been counting out the bass and counting out the melody, now you need to just look at where are the thumb and fingers playing together and where are the fingers happening in between? Because the thumb is calibrating what the time is. And so the fingers are all working as a function of that. So and four, and one. So there's the first time we pinch or play thumb and fingers together. And two, and three, and four, that's a pinch, and one, that's a pinch, two, three, and four, there's a pinch, and here's one more, one, and two, two, and three, and So um, if you look at the, at the PDF, uh, if you download the PDF and look at it, uh, I've written out just the bass line and written out just the melody and then written out the arrangement again, marking off every place where you pinch, every place where the thumb and fingers are playing at the same time. So that's how learning a tune can turn into a cool exercise for getting that coordination together that picking hand coordination of like, what is the thumb doing? What are the fingers doing? So if you have trouble keeping the thumb steady while you go to play the melody, if every time you start to play with the fingers, it derails your thumb, then you can do two things at once. You can learn a cool tune and you can use that tune as a practice tool to get that kind of solidity in your picking hand together so that, you know, you can play the tune consistently. And that, will be a way to learn about groove and about syncopation and how melodies fit together over the bass. And you'll be teaching yourself, uh, again, about phrasing, about how blues is played. So there's nothing like getting into the nitty gritty of how the melody sits over the bass and how the bass goes to really start to get a hands-on, no pun intended, you know, deeply felt appreciation for how blues is put together and how it feels when you actually are inside it and playing it. Now, once you have that, one more thing you can do, as I mentioned earlier, is start to draw in other elements that you like. So one thing that I noticed, well, two things, when I was uh, starting to put together my own arrangement of this tune, I went and listened to a bunch of different versions of it, which is one thing you can do when there's a tune that's been around for a long time. And I noticed that a lot of, uh, you know, when this tune got played by a band, it was often played with a shuffle feel. 
So instead of having this steady bass like this and having the shuffle feel be implied by the melody, you can actually overtly state it in the bass by doubling up the thumb and playing one and two and three and four and. And so you can go through the whole tune putting that bass in. And some people think it's actually a little easier because everything's a pinch, right? So that can change the whole feel of the tune. And another thing that I really liked was I was listening to the Sister Rosetta Tharp version of the tune, and she was a great uh, gospel singer and guitar player in the 1940s and 50s. And she added more changes into the tune or played it with more changes in the tune than say Fred McDowell would have. And so in bar four, instead of going to the A minor chord, she would go to the F sharp and then B7. So bar three, five and six you would go through a whole one six two five turnaround e7 c sharp seven that's the six chord f sharp that's the two b7 that's the five so So um, I think of that as starting to embellish the more fundamental version of the tune. So if you look in the tab PDF, you'll see an embellished version, which has uh, the shuffle feel and has the Rosetta Tharp chords. So that's one more thing you can do. So you can use the fundamental to work on your, the, the basic tune to work on your right hand coordination, to work on your phrasing, building up a sort of vocabulary of blues moves and blues rhythms. And finally, you can embellish the tune. Uh, you know, that's an opportunity to pull in different elements of different versions of the tune and see how they sit together and how you can start to do this process of adding and, and uh, dropping out until you get to a version of it that you think sounds cool, which means you're taking this traditional tune and you're doing what everybody else has done with the tune which is figure out how they want to play it. And I can't stress this enough. When you hear a version of a tune that you love, what you're hearing is not someone imitating someone else. You're hearing someone go, ah, I think this is how it goes. The spark, the thing that makes that version sound great, the reason that you know I really like hearing Sister Rosetta Tharp, or maybe you like hearing the Rolling Stones, or Fred McDowell, or whoever it is, whoever we like, we like what they're doing because we can feel that they're doing something of their own with the tune. We can feel that they're excited and in, about inhabiting that tune and doing something with it. And I want you to be able to feel that way too. And that comes from going through this process of starting with the bones of the tune, drawing from other people's versions, but figuring out, uh, you know, adding and reducing and taking in the things you like and leaving out the things you don't until you come up with a version of the tune that's true to the tune as part of a tradition but that speaks to you as having those pieces of it that you like and maybe even finding parts of it uh, beyond the traditional way of doing it that are completely you. So if you haven't downloaded the tab yet, go to the link below or the link on screen and download the PDF with all the examples from today's lesson. And in the next video, I'll show you the three things you need to know to start turning these eight or 12 bar tunes into complete songs. So if you feel like you're just playing fragments of tunes, like you're struggling to play the things you do know, like you don't know what to work on next, join me for the next video in the series to keep working on building a repertoire, playing with confidence, and making each song your own. If you've got a question about today's lesson, leave it in the comments down below. I would love to hear from you, and thanks for watching.